Okay, so so good afternoon to you in Addis Ababa. It's Andrew Kerr, I'm in Belfast here. And before we begin on looking at the uh, section in Genesis on the patriarch Abraham, let's just pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the privilege of loving you, of serving you, of experiencing your gospel grace in Christ, the seed of the patriarch Abraham, according to your covenant promise and gospel message promised to him and now revealed and disclosed in full to us. Uh, forgive us our sins, O God, when we have doubted you and grant us more grace that we might believe you with all our hearts and trust in all your promises concerning Christ and us in Christ. Uh, bless the men, help them understand what we learned this afternoon and as they share it through their own home uh, and through their family and neighbourhood and friends and church people and also through the provinces and country of Ethiopia. Uh, bless them and help them in every way. Grant me grace to teach them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, let's just go to screen share. Okay, and let's look at the lecture. I've entitled this lecture, Abraham, the Man of Faith. The patriarch is described by the Apostle Paul in the New Testament, both firstly as the father and secondly as the man of faith, the father of faith and the man of faith. And the Genesis account traces his faith from its inception by grace through maturation to perfection, as Hebrews tells us in chapter 6, 7 and 11. And why there are many other subsidiary lessons to learn in this section of the Genesis narrative. Other things do recede or fade into the background as faith in the divine promise is brought to the fore, put in the spotlight by Moses. The faith of Abraham is put in flashing neon lights. So while Jacob and Noah and Isaac could all be mentioned with respect to their faith, uh, Joseph in particular, uh, uh, it's supremely in this man's life that we get the best illustrations and Moses, uh, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit and the authority of the Holy Ghost, selects this material and presents it to the church in the wilderness uh, to teach them about faith and trusting God and, and how that grows and matures and what they're to believe in for their salvation and uh, how that faith will be tested. That comes to the fore in Abraham. That's why he's selected from a biblical a theological point of view to teach us on faith. And so from Genesis chapter 11 through to 25, there are many different aspects of faith which it will be important to draw attention to as we read or teach the scriptures week by week. Uh, I've said 11, 27, but actually it's chapter 11, verse 2 which is vital to look at in, in this respect. Okay, I need to try. I don't seem to be able to screen share here for some reason. Let me just try and get this on. Okay, it must have gone. I'm not sure why that happened there, but anyway, it did. So, Genesis chapter 11. And I'm going to change the color here because it's just a bit easier on my eyes. If I'm going to do that, let me see. Colors. Start. 
Most people begin the Abraham narrative at chapter 12, but really, you see, there are uh, 10 of these generational heading markers in Genesis. Uh, five of them have armed, these are the generations in the Hebrew. It's a little Hebrew word, wow, which is put on to the these are the generations and when there's why fronting on those generations or Toledoth formulae uh, it signals a connection with the previous uh, section and that happens five times and that just means that the sections aren't entirely separate they are structural markers but they aren't entirely separate sections they lead on from what came before but there are five occasions when there's no why fronting of the these are the generations where there's no little why this little word am to connect the generations and they are separate blocks of material that happens five times it happens in chapter two these are the generations of the heavens and the earth uh, it happens with uh these are the generations of uh, Noah, it happens with, these are the generations here of Shem, and it happens with, these are the generations of Jacob, and it also happens, sorry, these are the generations of Adam. And what that tells us is, Moses wants us to understand you know, the God's plan for redeeming creation, uh, the family line runs like this. The human race, Adam, uh, to Noah, the whole of the pre-flood race, then uh, to Shem, and through Shem, then to, uh, by the family of Abraham, of course, through Isaac, to Jacob. So that's, that's, how Moses is thinking concerning this seed promise. Creation, Adam, Noah, Shem, Shem and Israel or Jacob. So if, if we want salvation, it's going to be found in the seed line promise to Israel, to Jacob. So we read in verse 10 of chapter 11, these are the generations of Shem. When Shem was 100 years old, he fathered uh, Arphaxad after the flood, and Shem lived after he fathered Arphaxad 500 years, and his other sons and daughters, and so forth, right down to uh, when, or, so sorry, verse 27, now these are the generations, the, the, this is really one of these, and these are the generation. This links into Shem. It's not a separate section. And these are the generations of Terah. Terah fathered Abram, Nahor, and Haran. And Haran, and Haran fathered Lot. Haran died in the presence of his father Terah in the land of his kindred, the Ur of the Chaldeans. And Abram and Nahor took wives. Let, let me just explain. Expand my screen a little because it'll, it'll be easier for us all, I think. Okay, and Abram and Nahor took wives. The name of Abram's wife was Sarai, and the name of Nahor's wife, Milka, the daughter of Haran, the father of Milka and Iska. Now, Sarai was barren, she had no child. Terah took Abram his son, and Lot the son of Haran, his grandson, and Sarah his daughter-in-law, his son Abram's wife, and they went forth together from Ur of the Chaldeans, go into the land of Canaan. But when they came to Haran, they settled there. The days of Terah were 205 years, and Terah died in Haran. So how is this seed line promise for the salvation of mankind in Genesis chapter 3, 15, to resolve the sin problem 
of the first man and his family, the human race, going to be solved when the seed line is experiencing infertility and barrenness of womb. She had no child. Well, that's what we're going to see now. It's going to come to promise. Now the Lord said to Abram, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you and I will make of you a great nation. And I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and him who dishonors you I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abram went. He obeyed the gospel as the Lord had told him and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran and Abram took Sarah, his wife, and Lot, his brother's son, and all the possessions that they had gathered and the people they had acquired in Haran, and they set out to go to the land of Canaan. When they came to the land of Canaan, Abram passed through the land to the place at Shechem, to the Oak of Moray. At that time, the Canaanites were in the land. So let's go back to the lecture there. Okay, so we see here uh, the basis, firstly, of his faith. The faith of Abraham is grounded in the election of God who called him while a pagan out of Ur of the Chaldeans. James, of course, puts the stress on the obedience of his faith, which has to be understood, I think, properly against a background Judaizing that was laying claim to a barren, fruitless, mortified faith that produced no works. But true faith, of course, does, and that's James' point. He's not saying that we're actually saved by our works. It might sound like that, but it's it's got a background, you see. It, what he's talking about there is that if the uh, root of justification is uh, faith, the fruit or the outcome of true, genuine, regenerate faith is works. That's all he's saying, that good works are the proof of true faith. The problem with the people is they're hearing God's word, but not doing it. Uh, and the biblical message always had this idea, keeping the law was, was hearing it so that they might do it. It was never given just to become a creed lodged in their minds and memories. It was to be practiced. And that's his point of practical faith. Of course, without the true saving faith, you don't have the power to practice. You don't have the will or desire to practice. Uh, and that regenerating faith uh, comes uh, by God's grace through believing the promise of righteousness and proof imputed to us. So that's just to explain, James. I hope you see the distinction come back to me later if you have a problem with that. So Moses makes clear, as David and Paul abundantly note elsewhere, that in the divine economy of, or arrangement of how salvation is presented to us. Uh, grace always comes before faith. It's not that we believe in that God's gracious to us, rather God is gracious to us sovereignly. And we believe because faith is given to us. And it's through that faith then the instrument of faith we receive the promise, and we receive Christ. So grace always precedes faith, both instilled and empowered spiritually through the word of promise. It comes to us as a means of grace and creates faith. Uh, of course, we must exercise that, that faith, but faith is a gift of God, not of works so that no one can boast. Ephesians chapter 2, verses uh, 4 through 10. 
Uh, and a quick look at Genesis will show the promises of salvation were divinely initiated. They are monergistic. It's monergism. They were divinely initiated, established, and they preclude human cooperation, which is synergism. Uh, we'll see later on how Abram and Sarah, though believing that God's promise is true and, and trusting that, they take steps to try and help them along. They get impatient or they think they know best. Uh, that's synergism, DIY salvation, helping hand theology. And when we do that, we always mess things up. No, it's God's work alone. It's monergistic. So that's the basis of faith. Abraham is called in light of a sinful fallen race of Adamites, both before and after Noah. So it must be of grace. Abram was raised a pagan in Ur of the Chaldeans and moved to Haran, which is the main center of moon worship. We see that in Genesis chapter 11. So he wasn't called because he was godly. He, he was ungodly by, by nature and by practice. Abram was not seeking God while he was living in Mesopotamia, in Ur of the Chaldeans. It is the God of glory who first appeared to him before any human response was made on his part. And that appearance was based on the divine eternal purpose of Yahweh's choice and election, which was sovereign. Salvation is monergistic. We read, you're the Lord. Uh, the God who chose Abram and brought him out of Ur of the Chaldeans and gave him the name Abraham. You found his heart faithful before you and made him and made with him the covenant to give to his offspring the land of the Canaanites, Hittite, Ammonite, Perizzite, Jebusite, and Gergesite. And you have kept your promise, for you are righteous. And Stephen says, uh, Brothers and fathers, hear me. The God of glory appeared to our father Abram when he was in Mesopotamia before he lived in Haran. And he said to him, go out from your land and from your kindred and go into the land that I will show you. Then he went out from the land of the Chaldeans and lived in Haran. And after his father died, God removed him from there into this land in which you're now living. So both Nehemiah and Stephen in Acts teach us that it was God who took the first step. It was God's initiative and God's working and God's sovereignty. His faith is monergistic that's the basis and we also see that Abram further is given promises by God in which he is totally passive and receptive he simply receives the gift of the promise and the salvation of that gift contains uh, while the use of all the First person, I will, I will, I will verbs. I will give, uh, used of God as the subject. It puts all the stress on the fact that it's God who takes the initiative and it's God who says. Verses 1 to 3 of chapter 12, which we read. Now the Lord said to Abram, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. And I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great so that you'll be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, him who dishonors you. I will curse, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. And in verse 4 to 5, so Abram went as the Lord told him, and, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran, and Abram took Sarah, his wife, and Lot. Brother, son, all their possessions they had gathered. Please note the following important points which make divine monergism absolutely vital and central to the whole redemptive purpose carried on in the line of Abraham. It is the Lord who speaks in verse 1. He is told to go on the basis of the promise, I will show you, I will make you, I will bless you, I will bless you, I will curse, to which Abram simply responds in loving evangelical obedience of faith. Verse 4, 
But there's also a, a literary structure in verses one that we call it chiasmus, which means like the meat in the two pieces of bread uh, in the sandwich. I've got the phone here between the hands. Uh, it puts all the stress on, and emphasis on the central component of the phone in this uh, illustration. Uh, which is verse two, while putting brackets of, of the former and future family as a result of the obedience to the gracious promises before and after. So the focus in this text is on verse two, and I will make of you, and I will bless you, and make your name great, and I will bless those who bless you, and the before and after. That's simply Abram's response. In chapter 15, a similar pattern appears with the key thing to note in the covenant ratification ceremony that Abram is a sleeping partner while Yahweh alone takes upon himself to fulfill the and guarantee the success of saving promises by walking between the pieces symbolically with the fire pot or brazier, the torch. Uh, Abram's sound asleep. He's in a deep sleep. He's in the same kind of sleep at Tardema, which Adam slept with when the Lord put him asleep into a deep sleep to remove his rib from which he built Eve. Adam was under a general anesthetic, we might say, when he had his surgery. And so it is here. Abram is totally asleep in the darkness when they carcasses are split in two and laid out out with the birds not split but on two sides and God himself in the torch and the brazier passes through between the pieces and that's really a ceremony to say and we might get a hint of, of uh, the custom in the Jeremiah 34, 18, 20 that's simply to say, if I do not keep this covenant, then as covenant partner, uh, may this curse fall upon me. Abram's not there. It's God who's guaranteeing and ratifying and confirming he will secure the blessing, but also his willingness to take the curse upon himself. So in actual fact, uh, Yahweh is taking the part of Abram here and as a substitute he's agreeing to receive the curse himself. Uh, let's just look at Jeremiah 34 18 to 20 and we'll see if we can get that. Jeremiah 34, 18. Okay, this was in Zedekiah's day. King Zedekiah, the prophet, had told them to release the slaves uh, because they'd made their own uh, country to, to the covenant. It was completely against covenant law. They made their own brothers slaves. They, their brothers sold themselves into slavery, and that was never to be done to a native Israelite. It wasn't to be done. So Zedekiah told release the men, and the people agree that, but then they later go back in it. And so the curse falls upon them. So he, he writes this, and the men who transgress my covenant did not keep the terms of the covenant that they made before me. I will make them like the calf that they cut into and pass between its parts. The officials of Judah, the officials of Jerusalem, the eunuchs, priests, and all the people of the land who pass between the parts of the calf, and I will give them into the hand of their enemies and into the hand of those who seek their lives. Their dead body shall be food for the birds of the air and the beasts of the earth. And Zedekiah, king of Judah, and his officials, I will give into the hands of their enemies and into the hand of those who seek their lives, into the hand of the army of the king. 
of Babylon. So that's what happens when the covenant is broken. Uh, let's just look then at Genesis uh, 15, because uh, this is one of my favorite passages in the whole of the scriptures. If, 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 well, it's, it's, it's just wonderful. Genesis 15. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Fear not, Abram, I am your full body shield that my gain. Your reward shall be very great. He's El Shaddai. He's his all sufficient Lord. But Abram said, O Lord God, what will you give me? For I continue childless, and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram said, Behold, you've given me no offspring, and a member of my household will be my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, This man shall not be your heir. Your very own son shall be your heir. Uh, that's the gospel uh, promise again, elaborated on. And he brought him outside and said, Look up at the heaven and count the stars if you're able to. Then he said, So shall your offspring be. And here's the faith. Here's the God-given trust, and he believed the Lord, and he counted or reckoned or calculated or transferred to his account or imputed, we would say, it to him as righteousness. It's the righteousness of Christ contained in the promise imputed to his account. Uh, He's justified by grace through faith in the promise and counted righteousness, alien righteousness of God counted to him. And he said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to possess. But he said, O oh Lord, how am I to know that I shall possess it? He said to him, Bring me a heifer, female goat, a ram, a turtle dove, and young pigeon. And he brought all these, cut them in half, and laid each half over against the other. But he did not cut the birds in half. And when the birds of prey came down in the carcasses, uh, Abram drove them away. As the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell, and Abram, behold, dreadful and great darkness fell upon him. Then the Lord said to Abram, know for certain that your offspring will be sojourners in a land that's not theirs, and will be their servants there, and they'll be afflicted for 400 years. But I will bring judgment on the nation that they serve, and afterward they shall come out with great possessions. As for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace, you shall be buried in a good old age, and they shall come back here in the fourth generation. For the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. So they're going to go into slavery uh, for 400 years. It's not specified yet, but it's Egypt. But then they'll come out with great possessions, uh, but he will be buried at a good old age. He's not going to share this. He's not going to have possession in the land for himself. The only thing he has is a strip of land in the field of, uh, the field of, the cave of Machpelah in the field of, along the Hittite, uh, the trees of Mamre. And they shall come back here in the fourth generation. Good 400 years, and the people will come back. For the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. God's patient, not wanting sinners to perish, but to repent. But their sin will have ripened in full, and that then they're ripe for judgment. And so God sends. It's important that we understand the conquest of Joshua here. Uh, why it was right that Israel under Joshua, exterminated and slaughtered the Canaanite tribes because they were appointed as God's sword of judgment to exercise divine judgment for their sin. Therefore, Israel was to act in the place of God and to judge the Amorites for their perversion and child sacrifice and wickedness. And that's why it was justified. All judgment now belongs to somebody exercises it, doesn't he? Even today, through uh, godly government, 
when the sun had gone down and it was dark, behold, a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch passed between these pieces. And that day the Lord made a covenant. So see that? It's it's God when the sun had gone down. And dark, behold, a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch. Not Abram who's sound asleep. On that day the Lord cut a covenant. It's a covenant initiated with Abram saying to your offspring, I give this land from the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates, the land of the Kenites, Kenazites, Kadmonites, Hittites, Perizzites, Rephaim, Amorites, Canaanites, Gergesites, and Jebusites. So, back to the lecture. Okay. Uh, and the fleshly idea of adoption uh, and later the indiscretion of action was an involvement of the flesh synergism really and was contrary to God's plan for a supernaturally conceived seed Isaac in which there must be no human involvement whatsoever and as is made clear to Abraham in Genesis 15, 17 and 21 salvation is all of God's gracious promise and action which are inherited by faith or, or through Faith. Now let's just have a look at, at the flesh. Uh, we've seen the question about Eliezer of Damascus. Can I adopt him? Uh, God's answer is no, it'll be your own seed. And then the discretion of action in, in chapter 16, 1 to 6 and 9 to 12. Uh, now, Sarai, Abram's wife, had born, which was still. So what's the answer? Well, let's just give God a helping hand here. Maybe that will work. We believe God's promise will we'll have an heir, and uh, through him all the nations will be blessed. But surely it's not my child. I'm barren. Ah, I've got an Egyptian servant. She's probably capable and fertile for bearing children. So, Abram, you go to Hagar, and Hagar's child conceived by you will be mine. And that will be the heir. That was the idea. That was the flesh. No. God was going to do something without any human involvement at all. It was going to be monergistic. And Sarah said to Abram, Behold, now the Lord has prevented me. Because it's God's fault. That's the excuse you see for flesh. Look at this problem. God has permitted it. And have prevented me from bearing children. Go into my servant. We must always wait on God's promise and not take it into our own hands. It may be that I shall obtain children by her. And Abram listened to the voice of Sarah as, of course, Adam listened to the voice of Eve. So, after Abram had lived ten years in the land of Canaan, Sarai, Abram's wife, took Hagar, the Egyptian, her servant, and gave her to Abram, her husband, as a wife. And he went into Hagar, and she conceived. And when she saw that she had conceived, she looked with contempt on her mistress. And Sarah said to Abram, May the wrong done to me be on you. I give you my servant. To your embrace, and when she saw that she had conceived, she looked at me with contempt. May the Lord judge between you and me. See, it was God's fault, and now it's Abram's fault and Hagar's fault, not Sarah's fault. See, we sin blames when it's really uh, the problem. But Abram said to Sarah, Behold, your servant is in your part. Do to her as you please this weakness on his part. Then Sarah dealt harshly, and Hagar fled. But the angel of the Lord found her and said, Don't flee, Hagar. Uh, I'm going to give you a son, and he's going to have a nation. He'll be at odds with all his brothers, but he will be multiplied into a nation. Go back and submit the angel of the Lord. Said to her, return to your mistress and submit to her. I will surely multiply your offspring so that they cannot be numbered for multitude. The promise of 
Ishmael being like a wild donkey, fighting with everybody all around him. So she called the name of the Lord, who spoke to her, You're a God of seeing. For she said, Truly, here I've seen him who looks after me. Therefore, the well is called Beer, the high road. So even out of an awful family situation, which sin had created and flesh had created, trying to help along God's purpose. Flesh always has consequences and complications. Wait and trust God. And Hagar bore Abram a son, and Abram called the name of the son, and Hagar bore Ishmael. Abram was 86 years old. Time is running out when Hagar bore Ishmael to Abram, but he's not the son of promise. So we have to learn that salvation is all of gracious promises and actions which are inherited through faith. So we see, uh, firstly, um, the basis. Secondly, we see that it's covenantal. There's good reason to believe that the Holy Spirit prepared, appointed, and led Moses, skilled in all the wisdom of Egypt, according to Acts 7, to sequence or order the Abrahamic narrative according to a covenantal structure. This also appears be true to the Pentateuch in a general sense. At the very least, at four key junctures in the narrative in chapter 12, 15, 17, and 22, uh, the career of the patriarch Abraham is punctuated by very significant and momentously important the ratification, then the seal of the covenant in chapter 70. It's not a different worksy covenant as someone suggested. It's a continuation of the one promise. Uh, chapter 22, the oath to confirm it. Uh, so let's just unpack this a little. The formal covenant announcement in chapter 15 simply adds solemnity, veracity, or truthfulness and certainty to the original covenant promise, which Yahweh made sovereignly to the patriarch in chapter 12. So when we encounter promise language, which includes oath, curse, blessing, land, seed, and inheritance, we should recognize these promises passages as specifically covenantal. This is what the covenant consists of. Promise, oath, curse, blessing, land, seed, inheritance, along with the covenant parties. There's good reason to think that the narrative which follows on from each of the sections is assessing Abraham's follow-up faith response to this piece-by-piece -piece covenantal promise revelation. For example, after 12, 1 to 3, Abraham responded in faith and went, but at first, Famine test is departure to Egypt, which may in itself not have been sinful after all. He was the bearer of promise. God had promised him a seed and he wants to stay alive. It's a severe famine. But what other choice does he have? That's certainly Calvin's view. Uh, but proceeding then to tell hard truths or lies about Sarah, his wife, who was his half sister, but it jeopardized the whole uh, program. You see, uh, God wanted to have a son through his legitimate marriage through Sarah, and now she's taken off to the harem of Pharaoh. Well, Calvin interestingly says that what was going on here in the Pharaoh the patriarch's mind was a, an unwavering hope, as I think Hebrews describes it, an unwavering faith in the promise. He believed his son would be the Messiah and the heir for world blessing. He trusted God for that, but he wasn't sure whether or not Sarah would be the mother. So if it's a choice between her womb and uh, and his life, which is necessary to sire the son, then it's got to be his uh, life and maybe 
trusting God for the safety of his wife, yet exposing her to danger. That's Calvin's view, and I find that helpful last week, just preparing for this. Uh, okay, the, these lies on the patriarch's part are an example of unbelief, or may, maybe unbelief in terms of the of how it's going to be accomplished, or at least the flesh, and therefore a breach of covenant faith. Nevertheless, it seems God is determined to be gracious, for in spite of this act of folly, blessings continue to accrue to Abraham, while cursing is suffered by Pharaoh. Equally, in chapter 13, uh, that assumes a brighter, sweeter view, uh, such as now the extent of the covenant blessing with Abraham fully persuaded that the God had given grant of the land is already as good as his that he gives first choice of the plot a lot in chapter 13, which is an excellent act of faith, uh, which received approving confirmation with Abram told to stake out the hold of Canaan, for that's going to be his. Uh, so too, or so also in, in chapter 14, a future royal rule is made known by writing the Hostage taking four king Mesopotamian alliance led by Chedar Larmer with a tiny household army of 380 men, perhaps supported by his covenant partners and Aaron Eshkol, for he's a covenant making man, you see. He's known for loyalty. He can be trusted in chapter 14, 8 to 16 with the local true worshipper, priest king Melchizedek, again pronouncing God's blessing in chapter 14, 17 to 24. Maybe we can come back to that uh, later. A similar point could be made about the carnal policy of chapter 16, verses 1 to 16, as a synergistic response to a call for monergistic faith, uh, or for the line laughter in chapter 18, verses 9 to 15. Faithful intercession, chapter 18, 22 to 33. Uh, stumbling capacity, uh, his ability to stumble, and yet the blessing has continued in chapter 20. And the sacrifice of Isaac and the burial of Re Rebecca, these are all challenges to his faith. Uh, and Yet we also see the, the meticulous care of God to guard the bloodline for future covenant inheritance by marriage. Uh, or, sorry, that's his own, that's not God, that's his own concern. God, given, of course, uh, to make sure that, that his son marries the right girl and the covenant line is preserved in chapter 24 and the necessity of emigration. So what's, uh, yes, it's, it's covenantal. So covenantal interests are really right to the fore here. And just as uh, missing the key theme, faith, would be to change the Abraham narrative into a random collection of minor themes. So failing to relate this faith to its content covenant promise will rob readers and hearers alike of the proper object of their faith, open love that come through the sword promises of God's word. It's, it's really all to do with his response to the covenant. That's what this is uh, really about. It's all his response to the covenant. And so we uh, mustn't miss that. So if the section is presented in covenantal terms, uh, we should strive in our sermons to try to keep this one of the main, if not the main central idea. It's, it's faith in the covenant promise. So uh, it's also objective. This is one key object in the faith of Abraham, although his eye of faith looked 
towards and places trust in at least a, a, a threefold single object. There's the divine object of his faith. What's he trusting in? It's something concrete, it's something objective. There's a divine object. While the faith of the patriarch Abraham was directed to have fixated upon the promises that God gave, it was given by the Lord himself, variously named in the Abraham narrative as God, Lord Yahweh, Del Shaddai, the Lord Almighty. As dear heart as was points out in biblical theology, at this stage of progressive revelation, faith in the divine names and the character being and nature of the deity they disclose plays a powerful part and is a key elemental component of his growing, maturing, learning, patriarchal faith. Abram set his faith on the promise, but particularly on the God who had promised to bless. He's trusting God. His object of trust is focus. It's the God who gives the promise. Because without God, the promises can't be fulfilled. So behind it all is God. He's believing God. He's believing God is truthful, as Voss points out in Genesis 15, 6. The Hebrew verb here should be taken as a causative, uh, productive uh, verb, or what we call a factative sense uh, with the prepositional signaling that was the personal point at which assurance sprang up uh, was a personal Jehovah in whom he also came to rest. Uh, hence he developed assurance in Jehovah. Let's just look at 15 verse 6. Okay. You see, okay, the promise is given, and he believed the Lord. That's when the faith springs up, and he sets it on God, and he counted it, and, and Yahweh counted it to him as righteousness, even though he was unrighteous in himself. as a pagan, you remember, called from idolatry and superstition. He simply believed the Lord, and the Lord, Yahweh, Credited to him as righteousness for Jesus' sake, of course. He was a truthful but also a powerful God. Abram's faith attachment is not simply to God alone, but to the God who will exercise supernatural power on behalf of those who trust him. Voss contends that supernaturalism is not marvelous self demonstration, but actually the core of true. Righteousness. Such faith is both negative, leading to full renunciation and expecting nothing from himself, and positive, expecting all from God by supernatural interposition. Romans 4 and Hebrews 11 uh, show. So he expected God to have the power to. Uh, provide this righteousness and this salvation. He's a truthful, powerful God and a personal God. Thus, we see that Abram's faith is a profoundly God centered piety and godliness. For his supreme blessing is God Himself. Genesis 15 1 I am your shield, your very great reward. For this, uh, divine treasure, Abram is ready to renounce all other gifts and lesser goods. So there's the divine object who is truthful, powerful, and personal in Abram's view as he trusts. There's also the verbal object, uh, the word in which he trusted this God, but whom the patriarch places on wavering trust, gave his sworn promises by the means of revelatory word which was the appointed means of grace, whether at this stage verbal or visionary. Abram placed full implicit trust in what God had said in his revealed world, uh, in his revealed word to him. Thus, this reliance upon the word of God is an 
eminently religious act. It's not the prerequisite of faith, but an element of faith itself. He trusts God. He trusts God's word, which God gave, and it's unwavering. And it's also a promised object. It's a divine verbal promise object. Yahweh's covenant word had sworn land, seed, and blessing. And this provided the content of covenant knowledge upon which Abram set his trust. So he set his trust on the God who gave the promise, on the promise that was given, and the thing that was promised by God, the land, the blessing, and the seed. And we see also it became a saving object. Finally, Abraham believed, and it was this that justified him, that through a promised seed, the Lord would bless the world and provide forgiveness of sins and a return to the reconciled state. You see, Abram's conscious, he lives in a fallen world of sin. He knows there needs to be a way back to God from the dark paths of sin. That's what he's looking for. That's what he's seeking in God. Forgiveness of his own guilt and his own sin. It is interesting to note, however, that Voss suggests that the reason Paul compares Abrahamic and Christian faith is not per se that both believed in the raising of Jesus Christ from the dead, but because faith in the resurrection of Isaac and Jesus, while differing in object, intersect. They meet in a faith that is able to confront and incorporate the supernatural. So that's what Boss says. Okay. Uh, we're on page seven here. Let's just go for another bit of that, then we'll pause. It, it's a uh, We saw the basis of faith was grace. We saw it was a covenantal faith. We saw it was objective faith. Also justified faith. It was belief in the word of God regarding the seed through whom all nations would be blessed. That was credited to Abraham for righteousness. There was no merit involved in faith, which is simply the instrument like the hand receiving the present. Hand doesn't, uh, isn't the gift itself. It's not salvation. But the gift, the hand receives the gift. But you have to take hold of it by the hand, the hand of faith. There was no merit involved in faith, which was simply the instrument for receiving the promise and trusting in what God had said. This, it appears, seems to have been the unwavering element in patriarchal faith. He was absolutely sure God would, through his heir, bring saving blessing to the world and reconciliation, reunification of the race. What was in question is how it would come about and through whom that God would secure for him the inheritance of the land. So it was justifying faith, but also monotheistic faith. Such total reliance upon Yahweh left no room for other gods that may have been conceived to exist. For God monopolized, one has said, Abraham to the extent of the exclusion of all others. This explains the call away from Ur of the Chaldeans, away from pagan polytheism, Joshua 24, 2-3, which had previously prevailed in his family circle, Genesis 31, 9 indicates this, until finally it was removed by Jacob in 35, 2. But at the start it was clearly only one God. Let's just look at Joshua 24, 2 to 3, Joshua 24, 
2 to 3. And Joshua said to all the people, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Long ago your fathers lived beyond the Euphrates, Terah, the father of Abraham and of Nahor, and they served other gods. Then I took your father from beyond the river and led him through all the land of Canaan and made his offspring many. I gave him Isaac. So the gods are put away. That's important, vitally important. So, uh, and it's interesting, I, I came across this elsewhere during the week and thinking about this lecture, uh, how it was God's purpose to, why at the end of chapter 15 does God tell the people he's going to send them down to Egypt for 400 years or to a foreign land. Why was Egypt sovereignly chosen? Why did Joseph have to go through all of those expenses to bring the people down to feed them in the time of crisis? Well, there's many reasons for that, of course. That was chiefly God's sovereign purpose, but uh, there is uh, this additional reason uh, because the Canaanites, you'll remember uh, Judah is tempted, well, he's not tempted, but he engages in an act of harlotry uh, with, uh, with, with uh, Tamar. Uh, the, the, there's this constant temptation to intermarry and mingle with the women folk of Canaan. And likewise, the women with the, uh, the men, uh, this pressure to intermarry and intermingle and interbreed and, and pollute the covenant line and pollute the holiness and uniqueness of God's people. So what's God's answer? Well, they go to Egypt and the Egyptians hate shepherds. And so they're settled in Goshen in a distinct community by themselves. And they're relatively speaking kept free from racial contamination and intermarriage, which was important for God's holy people in the Old Testament. Now, of course, the barriers have, have come down and the church consists of believers from every nation, tribe and tongue. And the only barrier to marriage is, uh, of course, uh, that you marry in the Lord. Very important. So, uh, and then his faith was active. The faith of Abraham was not simply a sense of the mind or resolution of the will or the response of the heart, but by the spirit, a subsequent active response of the whole person, mind, heart, and will to the antecedent what came before passive reception of the word of promise. Thus, the, the initial assent to the truthfulness of the statement gives way to a trust of a far wider reach and a more practical significance. So his faith wasn't in abstract ideas, but a faith in vital concerns. Uh, the promise first received, then worked and solicited a reaction from Abram's intellect, will, and emotions for the entire religious consciousness which comes to rest and finds assurance for its deepest and farthest reaching practical personal needs and desires. Faith involves the whole person in this casting of itself and trust upon God and his word and what he had promised. It begins and ends with trust in God. And for the most part, faith is clear, or it's clear that as the New Testament confirms that Jacob did not waver in his trust concerning the promise. Nevertheless, there are, as we've noted already, a number of instances where this helping hand synergism creeps in as Abram, believing the promise, seeks to bring it about through carnal means and his own contribution and that of Sarah and Hagar. 
In addition, there are moral lapses along the way when the patriarch lies about Sarah and comes in into contact with pagan with whom he compromises in fear. And yet, even in that, as Calvin has noted, there is faith because he's convinced that he has to be kept alive to Sarah and, and give birth to the child of promise. So it's fallible. It's also on Abraham, the faith of Abram did not waver uh, concerning the promise of God, concerning an heir through whom all the world would be blessed. And even on Mount Moriah, you can go so far to assume through working out divine possibilities that God may raise his son Isaac from the dead. And we see it's an obedient faith. Abram believes in the word of God and responds to the commands of God, not only to circumcise his male descendants, but also to leave Ur and Haran, and set up home in a land of which he does not know the location. Furthermore, he commands his household to walk before God and be perfect. In all these things, the patriarch is a model of prompt obedience to the instructions God gives. It's evangelical obedience, but it's also uh, developing faith, and we'll come back to this shortly. I'm just going to pause this now, if I can do that. Let me see. Okay. Okay. So we're back after a short break. And we see there, nextly, that his faith is a developing faith. Uh, we see this in the following ways. There's progress throughout the concept, or uh, throughout the narrative, the concept of faith, trust is not academic, but, is, but it is Semitic in Hebrew. Yet gradually, this trust is modified from a fear and awe of God in chapter 15, verse 1 and 12 to 17, through to reverence and respect for God and in God, in chapter 17, 17 to 22. And finally, friendship, friendly feelings that predominate in chapter 18. There's a fellowship meal, of course, in chapter 21. And then again, chapter 22. So there's a progress and a growth in this faith and the uh, nature of, of his trust in God. It gets warmer and warmer and more personal. We would expect that with any relationship. It's also uh, particular. Uh, this is most evidence. Uh, it's most in evidence in the theophanies, which are devoid of fearful elements, which reach uh, a pinnacle, really, of Old Testament condescension, perhaps with the exception of Mount Sinai, where God appears, and yet his servant is, uh, he warmly receives him, and uh, isn't uh, terrified by that. Then there's a pattern of development. This growing familiarity resembles a pattern of pre-fall Adam and post-fall Enoch, who walked uh, in communion with God in James 2.23. And he's called his friend. This verdict is not human but a divine verdict. For God was determined to disclose the divine agenda to him as well. Remember that in Genesis 18, 17 to 19. Uh, then Abram fell on his face. Uh, sorry, 18, uh, 19. So they, the, there's this, uh, these three visitors, the Lord, and subsequently, as we learn, uh, two angels who 
the patriarch uh, hosts with, with a sumptuous meal and he, he serves the Lord and washes his feet. Uh, of course, with, with a greater condescension now, don't we, in Christ, who, who washes our feet and is the host. What a servant the Lord Jesus is in his death and resurrection and giving of himself for us and for our, our guilt, the righteous for the unrighteous. But just by the way, the contrast there. And following the meal uh, with the Lord and the two angels, as we subsequently learn in verse 16 of chapter 18, the men set out from there and they looked down towards Sodom and Abram went with them to set them on their way. The Lord said, shall I hide from Abram what I'm about to do? Uh, seeing that Abram shall surely become a great and mighty nation and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. In him, for I've chosen him that he may command his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing righteousness and justice, so that the Lord may bring to Abraham what he promised him. Uh, so, uh, what does a friend do? The concept of friendship in Scripture, it's not so much that God is our friend. Uh, God's uh, never called our friend in scripture as far as I'm aware, but rather uh, God calls Abram his friend. He is a friend of God. And why is a friend? Because what friends do is confide in each other and share things. And so they transcend that God can never be. Abram's friend in the way we think of friends. But in this uh, limited sense, Abram is his friend because he's taken into God's confidence. God confides in him his will and purpose. Then the Lord said, because the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is great, their sin is grave, I will go down to see. And if not, I'm going to overthrow them. That's the point. Uh, okay, so the, the divine agenda is disclosed. It's also preserved. Uh, nevertheless, the power of God is never far away in chapter 18, 27. And fear still colors the friendship with God, but issues and works out in submission, humility, and trustful intercourse. There's always a balance, of course, in this friendship. The way that always preserved, and the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abram believed God, he counted to him as righteousness, and he was called a friend of God. So it's also developing faith, but then it's mature faith. The patriarch is tested maximally at this very point of his trust. You see, everything to date has been predicated and based on the promise. And after the supernatural birth for which he had waited so long, uh, his trust is now threatened. And this promise seems to be in danger by the seemingly crazy instruction to put his only son to death. How can this be God's will? God's promise has come through this son, but how can I believe this? Do what he does believe. He trusts God. And we know from the New Testament, figuratively speaking, he raises, he, he believes that God will raise his son up from the dead if that's necessary. See, he believes in the God who gives the promise. He believes in the promise itself. And is even reasoning on the basis of the promise to what then God has actually promised. And so he proves the worthy by grace recipient of the redemptive revelation of God. Let's just look at chapter 22, 15 to 18. Uh, chapter 22, 15 to 18. 
Uh, and the angel of the Lord called to Abram a second time from heaven and said, I myself I have sworn to declare to the Lord, because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you and I will surely multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven and as the sand is on the seashore. Your offspring shall possess the gate of his enemies. Vic victory is promised and in your offspring shall all the nations of the earth be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. Now, what was the prelude to this? Well, you remember at the start of chapter 22, after these things, God tested Abram and said to him, Abram, and he said, here I am. He said, take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, this child of promise in whom the hope of the world blessing rests, and go to Moriah and offer him as a burnt offering. So Abram rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, and took the two young men and Isaac, and cut the wood for the burnt offering, and arose and went to the place where God had told him. And the third day, Abram lifted up his eyes and saw the place from afar. Then Isaac, then Abram said to his young man, stay here with the donkey. I and the boy will go over there and worship and come again to you. He believed that God would raise him up again after death. What faith? And Abram took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac his son, and he took in his hand the fire and the knife. So they went both of them together, and Isaac said to Abram, so said to his father Abram, my father, and he said, here I am, my son. He said, behold the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb? Abram said, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. So they went both of them together. When he came to the place of which God had told him, Abram built the altar there and laid the wood in the altar and found Isaac his son and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then Abram reached out his hand and took the knife to slaughter his son. But the angel of the Lord called him from heaven and said, Abram, Abram, he said, Here I am, do not lay your hand on the boy. And Abram lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him was a ram caught in the thicket by his horns. And Abram went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abram called the name of that place the Lord will provide. As it is said to this day, on the mount of the Lord it shall be provided. So he passes the test. It's also spiritual faith. We see projection. Not only did his faith originate in supernatural grace, but it was a state or act of projection into a higher spiritual world. There were promises, spiritual promises. These were physically only partially realized, but physically partially withheld. Why was this? It was this keeping back of what was typical that encouraged a futuristic orientation of faith, by which, says Voss, Abram learned to possess the promises of, of God in the promising God alone. So God promised him land. He promised him blessing. He promised the seed. And yet he only received them partially. So what did he do? He put his hope in the heavenly. He only got the type and part. And so he looked at the anti-type. There's projection and the promises and the proof. Abram looked beyond this earth, possessed or not yet possessed, form possession of the promise, identifying more closely with God himself, as Hebrews 11 10 says. By faith, Abram obeyed when he was called to go out to a place that he was to receive as an inheritance. He went out not knowing where he was going. By faith, he went to live in the land of promise as in a foreign land living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city that has foundations, his designer and builder is God. By faith, Sarah herself uh, received power to conceive even when she was past the age, since she considered him faithful, but promised, therefore, from one man and him as good as dead, were born descendants as many as the stars of heaven and as many as the innumerable grains of sand by the seashore. These all died in faith, not having received the things promised, but having seen them 
and greeted them from afar, having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. For people who speak thus make it clear that they're seeking a homeland. They have been thinking of, a, of that land from which they had gone out, they would have an opportunity to return, but as it is, they desire a better country. That is a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. So the, there was this inheriting in part of the earthly, which at the end of his life he hadn't received, and so he was in the heavenly. Uh, and also supranational. The scope of Abraham's faith is not confined to the single nation, not at all. For through his seed, uh, sorry, for though his seed had been elected and chosen in order to be the receptacle of the oracles of God as a holy family before God, the direction of travel of the promise, though the road will narrow first down to one, even Christ, is to include all nations. This is indicated by, by a number of factors, roots. The origin of Abraham is an Ur. He, he dwelt among the pagans. It's reference, the reference to all nations in chapter 12. His remit, he is commanded to be a blessing to other nations, to them. The rank, the precedence of faith before circumcision. Uh, Abram believed before he was circumcised, I think as Paul says this in Galatians, so that he might be the father of the uncircumcised who put their faith in Christ, but also of the circumcised uh, who, whose hearts are circumcised and who walk in the faith. You see, it's not all Israel that is saved. Ishmael is not saved, and yet Ishmael is part of Israel according to the flesh. Uh, Israelites are always truly spiritual ones. Uh, so uh, the promise of salvation comes to the Gentiles who are uncircumcised um, to the Jews who are circumcised to walk in the faith of the father of Abraham. Royalty, the encounter with Melchizedek uh, signals for the promise finally includes something greater than his own family. You remember in chapter 14, uh, the priest king comes out after the war of the four Mesopotamian kings uh, led by Chedalarmer with the five local kings of the Valley of Salt. Uh, he defeats them. He carries them off along with Lot, his nephew, who has gone to pitch his tents near Sodom. And so what does Abram do, he takes his 300 or so men by night, divides the company and along with his allies, his covenant partners, and some of them, Mamre, Anna and Eshkol. He goes and retrieves the people and the plunder and brings back Lot and his family. The king of Sodom comes to uh, give Abram the tribute uh, and the possessions and Abram says no no I don't want anyone to say God has made me rich uh, and he knows that his Lord is a possessor of, of, of heaven and earth so why would he do that so at that point then the king of uh, Salem the priest king Melchizedek uh, king of Salem peace Melchizedek, king of righteousness, this worshipper of God most high, comes out and gives uh, bread and wine to his guest, to Abram, 
uh, and blesses him and pronounces the blessing of possession upon him and his seed with victory and kingship promise, uh, the benediction of the priest king of peace, the king of righteousness, Melchizedek, who in this great forest of family trees, the Toledo, these are the generations, the generation is full of these trees, yet the, think of the book of Genesis as a great forest. And then you come to chapter 14, and there's no family tree. Melchizedek has no family line. He has no seed. He has no parents. He has no ancestors. He has no progeny after him. He has no ancestors before him. He's without lineage, genealogy, family tree, anything like that. It seems as if he comes from nowhere and goes to nowhere. He has this eternal kind of appearance, even though, of course, he must have had a, a ancestors. But Moses just leaves that out because he wants to give this impression under the Holy Spirit that Abram and Paul tells us in Hebrews, I think it is, that figuratively speaking, Levi, the priest, a tribe was in the loins of the patriarch and Abram pays the tithe to him. So clearly, Abram recognizes there's something greater than him. Uh, God, of course, but the mediator, this priest king, he pays him the tithe. The priest of the most high God, without the genealogy or family or beginning or end, seemingly. And that's, I think, what the book of Hebrews means in the you know, Kizadek, the title of Christ. Uh, the true uh, great high priest, the eternal great high priest, who's yesterday, today, and, and forever the same. Someone greater than Abraham. Let's just look at that chapter 14, important chapter. In the days of Amraphel, king of Shinar, Ariak, the king of Elazar, Jedar Lamar, king of Elam, and Pedal, king of Goyim, these kings made war with Bera, Bersha, Shinab, Shemeber, and the king of Bela, that is Zoar, all these joined forces in the valley of Siddim, that is the valley of Salt, Salt Sea, the Dead Sea Valley now. Twelve years they had served Chedar Lamar, but in the thirteenth year they rebelled. In the fourteenth year, Chedar Lamar and the kings who were with him came and defeated the Raphaim in Ashtaroth, Karnaim, the Zuzim in Ham, the Emim in Shavi, Kiriathayim, and the Horites in the hill country of Seir, as far as Elk Paran and the border of the wilderness. Then they turned back and came to and Mishpat, that is Kadesh, and defeated all the country of the Amalekites and also the Amorites who were dwelling in Hazrat Hamar. So they, the fertile crescent or king of lands led by Jedor Lamar, clears the land of these enemies to God's people. God sends them as agents of wrath and punishment. Then the king of Sodom, the king of Gomorrah, the king of Adma, and Ze Zebuim and Bela went out and they joined battle in the valley of Sidim. Uh, were kings against five. Now the valley of Sidim was full of bitumen, pits of tar pits, and as the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah fled, some fell into them, and the rest fled into the hill country. So the enemy took all the possessions of Sodom and Gomorrah and all their provisions and went their way. They also took Lot. He was dwelling in Sodom. Then one verse 13 who had escaped came and informed. When Abram heard that his kinsmen had been taken captive, he led forth his train men, born in Sodom, 318 of them, and went in pursuit as far as Dan. And he divided his forces against them by night. He and his servants and defeated them and pursued them to Hobah, north of Damascus. 
Oberon and Syria. Then he brought back all the possessions, his kinsmen, lot of possessions, the women and people. Verse 17, after his turn from the defeat of Cheddar Lamer and the kings who were with him, the king of Sodom went out to meet him at the valley of Shabbat, the king's valley. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was priest of God, most houses of fellowship meal. And he blessed him and said, Bless be Abram by God, most high possessor of heaven and earth. Well, if he rules all things. And blessed be God, most high, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And Abram gave a tenth of them. He, he tithed. And the king of Sodom said to Abram, Give me the persons, but take the goods for yourself. But Abram said to the king of Sodom, I have lifted up my hand to the Lord God, most high, possessor of, of heaven and earth, that I would not take a thread or sandal straw of anything that's yours, lest you should say I have made Abram rich. I will take nothing but what the young men have eaten and the share of the men who went with me. Let Ananesh go and Mamre take their share. So he recognizes that there's one greater than him. That's the point. So it's also an ethical faith. Abram was called to live perfect life in the pattern of his Lord. There are times and occasions in which he demonstrates moral lapses, yet, nevertheless, the patriarch stands out and above his contemporaries by far as a man, first and foremost, bent on the promises of God. His life is characterized by selflessness, kindness, friendship, faithfulness, godliness, and heavenly mindedness in fear of God and determined to walk in God's ways, as James points out and he, Hebrews affirms. Boss makes a number of important points in this regard. Abram lived as all it met on a high ethical plane. For despite many defects included, great virtues such as hospitality, magnanimity, loyalty, and self-sacrifice are, uh, are recorded clearly not by an idealizing redactor or editor as it's sometimes claimed for as already stated his faith and conduct at points are portrayed with realistic laws he really was a godly man and this aims to teach us or Moses aims to teach us by the spirit that Yahweh's favor goes hand in hand with ethical living for he called Abram to command his children in righteousness and justice, the obedience of faith, the fulfillment of the promise is suspended on obedience. He has to walk in God's ways. Sodom, Abraham realizes, since the judge of the earth is righteous, can only survive on an ethical basis. The pagans he meets have ethics beyond his circle. So even pagans can do good things. Ethics are not the content or, or ethics are not the content of or independent of religion, but the result an outworking of it in Genesis 17, 1, with the presence of God always before and behind to supervise. Morality is motivated by a desire to seek approval, not just from El Shaddai, the moral ruler, but from a God who shares his life with grace, the miracle doer. This uh, morality is put on a redemptive basis, says the boss, and is inspired by the principle of faith. Circumcision. Circumcision was practiced among surrounding and distant nations. So this is an old pre-existing rite which is invested with a new significance and meaning in chapter 17. It's not what's its purpose, what's the purpose of circumcision? It's not reproductive, it's not hygienic, but it's religious. Originally, it was a tribal badge connected with admission to a religion. It could be sacrificial or part 
or pull the flesh of the foreskin for the whole, the putting off of the flesh or self mutilation in honor of the deity. Well, it can't really be that because that was absolutely prohibited to Israel and it requires cleanliness. I'm just talking about the, uh, uh, the suggestions here. Uh, thus, it precisely signifies removal of uncleanness. That's its meaning. Removal of uncleanness or the flesh inside and outside Israel, which never developed or changed. It's used to subserve and undergird the teaching of ethical and spiritual truth. So it was removal of sin and flesh. That's what it symbolized. Uh, circumcision. Uh, the significance is only revealed slowly. Uh, so I'm just. Okay, we see also that circumcision is revealed, its meaning and significance is revealed only slowly in Scripture. Here it's just mentioned as a bare rite of circumcision. Moses uses it, he says he's a man of uncircumcised lips, uh, really uh, to signify that it disqualifies his speech. Some people thought he had some kind of speech impediment. Uh, but in Deuteronomy, uh, anticipating the prophetic era uh, where its spiritual significance will be brought out more clearly, in Leviticus, it's transferred to circumcision of the heart, and also in Deuteronomy, where it becomes a promise. Let's just look at Leviticus. 26, 14, Leviticus 26, 14. But if you will not listen to me and will not do all these commandments, if you spurn my statutes, if you soul support my rules so that you will not do all my commandments, then I will do this to you. I will visit you with panic. Wasting disease and fever that consume the eyes and make the heart ache and use the soul, see them vain. Okay, there's not much of a mention of circumcision here. Let me say, I don't think that's the right reference of, of God there. 2641. Let me just say again. Okay, but if they confess their iniquity and the iniquity of their fathers in their treachery that they committed against me and also walking contrary to me so that I walk contrary to them and brought them into the land of their enemies, if then their uncircumcised heart is humbled and they make amends for their iniquity, <coughs> then I will remember my covenant with Jacob and I will remember my covenant with Isaac and my covenant with Abraham. So clearly, it's signifying that Abraham and Isaac and Jacob were circumcised, not only physically, but spiritually. They walked in, in God's ways. There's this moral, ethical implication. And the people then have turned against that because they're proud, disobedient, uncircumcised, impenitent unrepentant hearts. That's the point. And in Deuteronomy 30, verse 6, let's just look that up. Deuteronomy 30, verse 6. The Lord your God will bring you to the land that your fathers possessed, that you may possess it, and he will make you more prosperous and numerous than your fathers, and the Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your offspring, so that you will love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, that 
you may live. It's a pudding of, of the flesh. It almost looks, you know, doesn't it, akin to regeneration. So it has this sign of ethical conduct, uh, but which has its roots in regeneration. And it is a promise of the new era, which is developed uh, by the prophets with a turn towards ethical hearing in Jeremiah 4, 4 and 6, 10 of the uncircumcised circumcised. In Israel, it must be something more than the outward right. That's the point. It's not just a physical right. It's not just in the flesh. It is in the flesh, but it's meant to symbolize an internal spiritual reality. And Ezekiel makes a similar complaint in chapter 44, verse 7. Chapter 44, verse 7. Ezekiel 44, verse 7, where we read this. And say to the rebellious house, the house of Israel, thus says the Lord God, O house of Israel, enough of your all your abominations in admitting foreigners uncircumcised in heart and flesh to be in my sanctuary, profaning my temple, when you offer to me food, the fat and blood, you have broken my covenant in addition to all your abominations. So then it's left for the New Testament for Paul to specify clearly in Romans 2, uh, 25, 29, and 4, 11 of Romans, Ephesians 2, 11, Philippians 3 and 3, and Colossians 2, 11 to 13, the true meaning of circumcision, the spiritual significance of the removal of the flesh, and that's only done by the spirit of grace. That's what the right was meant to signify. So ethically, we see uh, he lived on a high plane. We see this in circumcision. Was, he was called to this. And theologically, we should note that circumcision was instituted before the birth of Isaac and relates to the promise of the numerous Austerity. This was not to teach propagation wasn't clean in itself, but to show uh, not the act, but the product of propagation was to find the, the offspring. The, the human nature of the whole race was sinful. Uh, this had to be taught repeatedly in the Old Testament. We inherit sin from our parents, lest the people presume that natural uh, descent and birth gave them entitlement to the grace of God, which it didn't. Uncleanness disqualifies and must be taken away dogmatically. It, may, it signifies justification, regeneration, and sanctification, all three in Romans 4, uh, 9 to 12, and 2, 11 to. 13. So theologically, uh, spiritually, and practically, circumcision was important. But let's just read those words of chapter 17 then, as we close this part. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty, walk before me and be blameless, you see going to live this ethical life in response to the covenant of grace, that I may make my covenant between me and you, and may multiply you greatly. Then Abram fell on his face, and God said to him, Behold, my covenant is with you, and you shall be the father of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be Abram, high father, but your name shall be Abraham, father of many, for I have made you a father of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make you into nations, and kings shall come from you. I will establish my covenant between me and you, <coughs> and your offspring after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your offspring after you. See, he's justified at this point, but not yet circumcised. So he's a father 
of the Gentiles who believe and are justified through faith alone, but also the Jews uh, who, are who are circumcised. And I will give to you and um, to your offspring after you the land of your sojournings and all the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. And God said to Abraham, As for you, you shall keep my covenant, you and your offspring, after you throughout their generations. This is my covenant, which you should give. It's not the covenant itself, but it stands as the seal of the covenant, which assures them of the righteousness that they have through faith between me and you and your offspring after you, every male among you shall be circumcised. You shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskins and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and you. He who is eight days old among you shall be circumcised every male throughout your generations, whether born in your house or bought with your money from any foreigner who is not of your offspring, both he who is born in your house who is bought with your money shall surely be circumcised, so shall my covenant be in your flesh, an everlasting covenant in the flesh, to remind them of the spiritual significance. That's the point. And the moral demands and the righteousness of faith, the basis of, the basis of their conduct is grace through faith. Any uncircumcised male who is not circumcised in the flesh shall be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. Um, then, just very briefly, uh, Romans uh, 2 11 to 13. For God shows no partiality for all who have sinned without the law will also perish without the law and all who have sinned under the law will be judged by the law for it is not the doers of the law who are righteous before God but the doers of the law who will be justified for when Gentiles who do not have the law by nature do what the law requires their law themselves even though they do not have the law they show the work of the law is written on their hearts, while the conscience also bears witness and conflicting thoughts, accuse or even skews them. Of course, the Gentiles can't just by the law be justified. It really exposes their uh, sinfulness and weakness and their need of justification so that every mouth will be stopped and both of them circumcised and uh, circumcised. Uh, Romans 4, uh, 9 to 12 is maybe the, the verses I should have quoted. Yes. Blessed are those, verse 7 of chapter 4, uh, whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord does not count his sin. Is this blessing then only for the circumcised or also for the uncircumcised? For we say that faith was counted to Abraham as righteousness. How then was it counted to him? Was it before or after he had been circumcised? It was not after, but before he was circumcised. He received the sign of circumcision as a seal of the righteousness that he had by faith while he was still uncircumcised. The purpose was to make him the father of all who believe without being circumcised so that righteousness would be counted to them as well and to make him the father of the circumcised. You are not merely circumcised. You see, it was a seal, an outward seal of the inward reality of righteousness by grace through faith. They're not merely circumcised, but who also walk in the footsteps of the faith. The, the obedience that flows, the fruit of justification that our father Abraham had before he was circumcised. For the promise to Abraham and, and his offspring that he would be the heir of the world did not come through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. For if it's the adherence of the law, you are to be heirs. Faith is known, the promise is void. For the law brings wrath, but there is no law 
but where there's no love, there's no transgression. That's why it depends on faith. In order that the promise may rest in grace, be guaranteed to all his offspring, not only to the adherent of the law, but also to the one who shares the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. Okay, so I think that probably uh, completes the lecture for today. Uh, and we'll see you again tomorrow.